when I put the company together, I predicted $50 silver. Yeah. It happened, it took 10 years to do it, but it hit there. Yeah. But I didn't predict that silver would drop all the way down to 12, yeah. you know, and, and stay, stay between 12 and 15 for a couple of years. <clears throat> and that was very difficult. Silver is always looked at as, or not always, but predominantly looked at as the poor man's gold. And, and uh, I've, I'm always saying, no, it's not, it's not gold. Gold is money, silver is a strategic metal necessary for everything that we need to do with the human race. Hello and welcome back to Soar Financially, here from the floor of the Deutsche Goldmesse in Frankfurt, Germany. My name is Kai Hoff and I'm the at JR Mining Guy over on X and of course your host of the Soar Financial channel. Really appreciate you joining us and I'm joined by Keith Neumeyer, President CEO over at First Majestic Silver. And uh, Keith, it's great to see you in person again. Great seeing you as well and being at your conference in Frankfurt, it's always a pleasure. Appreciate you coming out. Like we saw each other last time in Boca Raton, I believe, in uh, Florida. That's right. Not as humid, minus two degrees out here, so a <laughs> bit of a different climate. A little bit different. Different sentiment as well. It's a big difference in metal prices for sure. Absolutely. Like, uh, it's, it's, I wouldn't say it's buzzing. I think uh, we've had a really good three months mm -hmm. uh, in, in the junior mining and junior metal space as well. When we met in July, the Fed rate cut wasn't a thing yet, and sentiment was still, eh, we were in the acceptance stage, I'd say, like early stages of acceptance when you go down the stages of grief. Uh, how have things changed? Well, I don't think we're still at the euphoric stage. No. You know, uh, you know, we see sentiment improving for sure, but uh, the juniors have improved a little bit. But, you know, I, I've got a portfolio of juniors myself, and I, I, I still am a little bit shocked uh, at how little they have moved. Not did they, move. they haven't moved at all. Mm -hmm. Let's be honest. Like, if you look at like yes, GDX, GXJ, they're up, mm -hmm. but they're. The not, not, you're not really tracking gold even. If I look at the, the big three, Newmont, year-to-date zero, yeah. uh, Barrick maybe 10% plus, the only one that's somewhat outperforming is Econico Eagle at 40%. Uh, what does it look like in the silver space? Well, our stock's up 40% a year-to-date. It's, it's most it's to do with our transaction. Yeah. That we, I'm sure we'll talk about that in a few minutes. But um, uh, So we've performed fairly well. But also, if you go back over the last couple of years, our stock has underperformed quite badly. I think, and uh, you go back to, you know, call it uh, uh, 2021, the stock was over $20 a share, and now it's $9, and then silver prices were 18 to compare it to 32 yeah. almost. I have to ask, since you're sitting here, is that just sentiment or were mistakes made? Oh, well, sure. I think there were some negative uh, uh, headwinds. You know, uh, a couple of things were happening simultaneously, so we got hit by a couple of bad bad news events, unfortunately. And uh, uh, we, we're behind that now, uh, which is great. Uh, you know, the Lincoln Tata water situation we had really affected the production there. Then we had the union issues of the St. Demas operation, which uh, caused a higher cost there and some lower production as well. Then we had the issues at Jarrett Canyon where we had to shut it down due to the major winter storm that hit that operation at the end of 2022. So it's just a series of things and uh, uh, things that all three of those operations have turned around and we're looking forward to a great uh, 2025. Yeah. In, in conversation with investors, one thing I've noticed is they're, they're kind of worried about the Jared Canyon um, addition to the, to the first logistic portfolio in, the re, in regard to terms of debt. And I remember us talking off camera last time that the debt wasn't really a problem, but I'm not sure the market really understands that. Can you run us a bit through that debt model? I think that needs some clarification. When you say debt, what do you mean Like you, you, do, you took on some debt when you bought Jared Canyon uh, as well, but you said it well, was fairly did. cheap debt. What? Yeah, well, we did a convertible, a That's, $240 million convertible. Yeah. Uh, the rate on that, it was 0.375%. Yeah, yeah it was zero I remember it was pretty much nothing. The cheapest convertible ever done in the mining space in, in the world yeah. on record which is quite surprising for a company yeah. of size. I just saw a convertible just being done yesterday and the rate was 4.75%. Yeah. Um, uh, so, you know, we're pretty happy to have this, it. almost like free money. Yeah. Uh, that convertible doesn't come due until 2027. Uh, we'll deal with it. It's, uh, it's changeable at, um, you know, quite a bit higher than the current market price. And, um, uh, but it's not really an issue, I don't think. Um, um, we'll, the, you know, the, you know, the Gattles transaction is a real game changer for us. Yeah. And, uh, you know, sure, we got a little bit criticized for, for the Jerry Canyon transaction. This gold, um, you know, it's in Nevada. You know, it, it was a step out 
from Mexico. And, yeah. and uh, you know, some investors, you know, thought it was a little bit of a risky move on our part. And maybe it was, but, um, you know, our our guys, you know, felt that they could fix it. We knew there was issues and uh, uh, fix it and operate it at the same time. Uh, we should have shut it down on day one. I think I probably told you that. Yeah, before. yeah we've discussed that yeah, before. But, uh, so. uh, but, you know, hindsight's, you know, 20, 20 <laughs> right? So, so you know, we we are very still keyed up about that asset. We've had three rigs on site there this year. Uh, we don't have any results yet. Uh, uh, but, you know, it, it's probably, if, you know, we've been quite surprised that we're actually getting approached to buy, buy it from yeah. from in, you know, interesting groups. So, you know, whether we JV it or sell it or whether we bring it back ourselves, yeah. it's still probably two or three years away. Yeah. Well, it's one of three roast, permanent roasters it is. in Nevada. Very, so that's that that itself is valuable. Really. It is. It's very strategic asset. Yeah. There were there were replacement costs to that mill would be about three hundred fifty million dollars. Yeah. So there is some really hidden costs there yeah. or, or um, value there. Since we spoke, you made an acquisition. Mm -hmm. You you bought Los Gatos. Actually, you a nice cornerstone asset now for for the company. Runs a bit through the transaction, and what does it add to the to the portfolio? Sure. Well, as you know, Kai, I built this business through M and A. You know, the, we we just uh, celebrated our twentieth year anniversary last September. Uh, September 2023, uh, and uh, uh, you know we've, you know every asset we've purchased seems to be just big, getting bigger and bigger. Uh, it's a bit of a challenge for us because you know we can't really fill our portfolio up with a bunch of million ounce producers because it, it wouldn't make any sense. So to get a big chunky asset, a 10 million ounce producer, they're hard to find. Um, Los Gatos has been on our radar for some time now, um, and we've been kind of going back and forth, and uh, the, the management team decided to launch a process earlier in the year, uh, and it was very competitive. You know, all the names you could imagine were, were, were working to uh, put bids in, and uh, we were successful at the end of the day. And, uh, um, you know, we were adopting a very good institutional shareholder base, you know, uh, Tom Kaplan at, um, you know, uh, 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 Electra, which is, thank you. <laughs> uh, uh, Tom Kaplan is, is becoming a key shareholder for Jessica, yeah. which we're quite excited about. Uh, they, he currently owns, uh, through Electrum, 38% of uh, Gatos, mm -hmm. and also a lot of uh, his institutional friends and, and associates are also big shareholders of Gatos. So, um, you know, First Majestic is a very retail story. It always has been. You know, it's a very liquid company, um, uh, probably somewhat attractive to the institutional shareholder base of Gatos, so possibly that was one of their decisions to, to choose us as the winner. But, you know, we paid up for it. Uh, uh, we started talking to them when the, the, the value of the company was quite a lot lower. Uh, we were surprised with the um, uh, movement in their share price over the period of time that we were negotiating uh, the transaction. But they were coming out with some pretty stupendous news. Uh, uh, there, you know, that mine, we just finished a uh, site visit. We've actually got people on site right now. And, uh, you know, um, uh, the mine is just humming. It's, it's doing extremely well. So, you know, adding that to our portfolio, what it does for us is it gives us three district scale assets under one umbrella. You know, San Dimas at eight, almost 80,000 hectares, uh, Santa Elena about 102,000 hectares, and Los Gatos at 103,000 hectares. These are big, chunky land packages with tons of exploration up. Side. So, you know, we're going to have three great assets that really don't have a, a issue with life of mine. Uh, the life of mine of all those assets are, are, are for the underground mines are, you know, seven to ten years. Yeah. Uh, no, that's great. And, uh, and, you know, we'll keep drilling. Uh, uh, we'll probably spend about $50 million on exploration mm -hmm. in 2025. Over 15? 50, five, zero. 50. Wow, okay. Yeah, or, that's a lot. Yeah, and because this year we spent about 30, 30 million yeah. just on our core assets. So, yeah, those yeah. guys are so that. So, it'll be another yeah. approximately 20. Yeah. So, we'll, we'll continue that, but uh, we're very excited about having that. They come with a great management team, a very strong operating skill set. Uh, so, it's really going to complement both companies quite well, having yeah. all three of those mines in one company. Run us through the acquisition term. How much did you pay for it? It was nine hundred seventy million dollars in, in stock, uh, yeah. first Majestic stock. So uh, both share prices have improved since the transaction was mm -hmm. announced. So the ratio is two point five five. So for every one share yeah. of uh, first Majestic, the uh, uh, Los Gatos, you know, for every one share of Gatos, uh, they get two point five five shares. Okay. So, did you take on any additional debt or anything? Like as part no. of the transaction, anything come with it? No, no. no they have yeah. some cash in the bank, mm -hmm. and uh, they're, they're they're decently funded. They got a good balance sheet. And, uh, yeah. Okay. 
Like, you, you sort of touched on it, but what does it do now to the new first Majestic? Let's call it that, like post-transaction, what does the production profile look like? And sure. I know you've always been keen on the silver to gold ratio. Mm -hmm. What will that look like post-transaction? Well, in 2024, uh, we'll be at 43% silver, 57% gold, mm -hmm. and that's all Doric. Uh, that's over our three uh, core assets, our three operating mines. Adding Los Gatos, that'll take us to 51% silver, 35% uh, gold, uh, and the rest in lead and zinc. So we'll then become a concentrate producer. Mm -hmm. But there's terms already in place of a Japanese outfit called DOA. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they, they take the zinc concentrate, and uh, then the, the lead con usually goes to either Glencore or Trafigura. Okay. And um, so it's great relationships super high quality concentrate so it's very much sought after yeah. so the terms they get with the smelters is very good fantastic dola was also a part owner of the company of las gatas as well was that's that? right that's okay. right there's a 70 30 joint venture mm -hmm. uh, so uh, we were actually acquiring 70 percent of the okay. mine and they own 30 percent okay no you're back over 50 percent for silver that must it, make you it, happy like, it does so, you know 51 percent silver it just, yeah. it just gets us there what's the cost profile in las gatas it, it goes down a little bit <clears throat> so our Costs are approximately about, you know, call it 18 mm -hmm. on average, um, uh, maybe 17. That's 18. all in, right? Just to clarify, then, all, all the same okay. cost, yeah. And then adding Los Gatos, it'll drop that to about 15, 16. Oh, wow. Okay. Range, yeah. 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 Or um, maybe, 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 maybe 16, 17, I'd probably okay. clarify. I'm trying to make this segue a little bit to, to the silver market now. The question is, like, did you see something in the silver market that prompted you? Maybe you mentioned the word paid up um, for Los Gatos. Is there something that gave you a bit more confidence, like, hey, it's okay, we're going to spend close to a billion dollars, but yeah. we see the silver market moving here. Is that, was that you know, part time, of the reason? Timing the silver market's always been a pain in the ass. You know? <laughs> like, I, you know, I put this company together, as I said, over yeah. 20 years ago. So, you know, I, I predict, when I put the company together, I predicted $50 silver. Yeah. It happened, it took 10 years to do it, but it hit there. Yeah. But I didn't predict that silver would drop all the way down to 12, yeah. you know, and, and stay, stay between 12 and 15 for a couple of years. And that was very difficult. We had to, we had to lay off a number of people and uh, uh, curtail exploration, curtail development, and uh, we had to sell a couple of mines and you know, lower, lower uh, profitable mines. So it was a challenging uh, environment. Now we're back over 30. Today's a great day. Uh, yeah. I'm sure you're watching gold and silver today. A little bit. Yeah, so so we're having a great day in the market today. But um, no, I'm a bull on silver, and I always had been. You, you know me. I came up with the phrase of uh, triple-digit silver years ago. Um, I, I, you know, I've seen other people copy that phrase now, so maybe, hopefully, I'll be right. Um, I, I think I will be ultimately. Uh, but you know, silver is a bit of an annoying metal. It's, just, it's extremely volatile. Very, very much. Very volatile. I was surprised, like. The silver market in particular, and uh, you must have seen that as well, but when silver broke out over 3250, mm -hmm. there was insane euphoria. Right. Like we, I've talked with silver companies that tried to raise $8 million. They could have raised 50. Right. Fortunately, they didn't take 50, but they could have easily. Um, do you see that as well? Like, and, and, and now it's back muted a little bit, like not muted, it's not dead. Mm -hmm. But euphoria sort of subsided a little bit. You said it as well. It's not euphoric at all right now. Mm -hmm. um, what, what is sentiment? Like, I'm trying to figure out a little bit, like the silver price movement, now we're at 3110 roughly again, recovering a little bit, but we didn't manage to hold that breakout level of 3250. Unfortunately not. It was, you know, I think it's, um, you know, fairly resistant level. You know, if you look at the chart you know, the, uh, over the last 20 years, it's only hit $30 three times in, in, in our lifetime, actually. So you go back, you know, even longer than that. Uh, so it is a bit of a, a psychological resistance level. So you know, if it, it I, once it does break out, I think it's going to be pretty uh, uh, amazing move after that. But it's got to consolidate. It's got to jump around a little bit. And you know, seeing gold pop through 2,700 today, and and silver now, you know, strongly above 31. You know, maybe this move will start to you know uh, uh, start again. But you know, we're going to the year end. We're going into you know Christmas, and uh, you know, generally, you know, December's not normally. Weaker, yeah, yeah, seasonally weaker. So, but you know, January, February, March could be very strong months. But like, I, I didn't, you know, we didn't buy Gatos because we think solar is going to move tomorrow. Yeah. You know, I can't really think like that. You know, I, I you know, I have to look at the long-term health of the business. So I, you know, you know, when we're doing M and A, you know, we got to look out five to ten years and what does the business look like. Yeah. And uh, you know, if if we're lucky and then silver goes to fifty bucks or or triple digits, as I'm suggesting it may, then all of a sudden, you know, it becomes great for our shareholders. Yeah. Since I, we've got to talk silver, silver market in general. Like, what, what does it look like? Silver, silver broke out a little bit, but it's not really tracking gold. We're still looking at gold silver ratio roughly of 80, 85, actually, uh, more to the higher end. Um, silver's not catching up to gold yet. What, what's what's holding it back? 
Well, you know, it's it's <laughs> it's, it's always a question I get, yeah. and, and uh, you know, it, it's whether it's the paper markets that 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 keep it, uh, you know, down. You know, I have a presentation later today talking about solar, um, uh, and there were some slides in there that addresses this point. But you know, we trade at uh, 240 to one uh, uh, in paper versus an ounce of silver. So for every one ounce of physical metal that trades, 240 ounces of, of, of paper metal trades at daily. Um, and that's pretty amazing. Uh, so does that affect price? It probably does. Um, uh, but it's, at the end of the day, these banks that are trading the metal, you know, for the big commercial buyers, you know, the big uh, the BMWs, the you know, Teslas, the you know, Panasonics, the Sonys of the world that are consumers of this silver, um, they have to buy the metal at some point. And, and when you're running deficits that the you know, 300, 400 million ounce deficits every year for multiple years, that's showing that that's got to show up in price. And I think it is showing up in price right now. You know, this move to over 30, you know, is fairly just really in the last six months. And I think people are starting to wake up to the green story. They're starting to wake up to the importance of silver, the fact that it is a strategic metal. Um, and, uh, you know, I look for, you know, your uh, audience today to listen to my presentation this afternoon. So, talking about that, I was uh, hosting a panel discussion yesterday with Kassan Batsyan. Mm -hmm. And uh, one, one thing you mentioned, which was interesting, I'm curious if you see it the same way, but he says there's a black swan, oh, we, we didn't call it a black swan, but a uh, demand emerging um, that, that nobody really had on their on their bingo cards, let's, call, let's say that for simplicity's sakes. That's uranium and uh, the, the nuclear space right. uh, picking up. SMRs, building of new nuclear reactors. Right. Everybody's talking about photovoltaics and batteries and everything, silver usage in there, but nobody's really talking about uh, the SMRs, the small nuclear reactors, for example, right. or small modular reactors. Mm -hmm. um, is that something you're seeing as well? Like, Because he sees massive uptake there. Yeah, and uh, Maria Spernova from Sprott um, yeah. out of Toronto uh, mentioned that at the beginning of her presentation oh, okay. at the uh, Silver uh, Symposium held in New York just two or three weeks ago that, that, that we attended. So people are learning about that, but it is a very secret industry. You know, we, you know, we're trying to find out how much a nuclear plant actually consumes. You know, we do know it consumes no. silver, and at some point we were hearing that, it, I don't know, I'm not a technical mm -hmm. guy or a scientist, yeah. so I'm probably the last guy to talk to about, you know, how much a, a nuclear power plant consumes, <laughs> but we know it's a large amount. Uh, and uh, once we get more details on the Silver Institute, I know it's doing some work to, to that, look at that market. That'd be interesting because nobody has that on there, like in their calculations. Right, right. Exactly. That's so. That's a brand new industry. I would call it a black swan, but it's a new demand driver. Well, you know, it, and with the governments now around the world starting to, you know, support nuclear, yeah. you know, you're even seeing Trudeau talk about nuclear, which is yeah. amazing. Yeah. So, <laughs> even in Germany, could give it give it some time, maybe in February, like after the new re-election or the new elections, yeah. we might be able to talk about it again as well. Yeah, yeah. So. Japan is, is there as well. Yeah. So, yeah, there's a lot of drivers there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One question that emerged out of that panel again as well, and I have you, I have to ask it, yeah, producers holding back supply mm -hmm. is, is, is a big topic just to, like the OPEC is doing, like they're managing supply and demand, of course. Nick, you've done it in the past, you've held supply back because you saw it's like, I can sell this more expensively or, uh, later on. Yeah. Is that still something you're looking at or considering? Is that even feasible these days? Well, if you, if you look at our last um, uh, news release on our financial statements, we held over 770,000 oh, okay. 770, ounces of silver we held over the quarter. Okay. So mm -hmm. most of that silver sits in our mint. Yeah. So we have a large minting facility in, in uh, Nevada, yeah. which we just opened up in March of this year. So we have to you know, have the inventory there, of course, to supply. But it's great because a lot of that inventory is you know, $20 silver, $23. Yeah. $25 silver, so the, the profits on that metal sitting on our floor is to do quite nice. And you know, the value of that metal is you know, around $25 million. And you know, it's not treated as cash, but it's you know, treated as uh, you know, uh, a part of our in inventory. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. yeah it's, that, a, it's a question because the same with the gold companies as well. Like, what would happen if Barrick New Money and Nico held back production? It's hard though because uh, a lot of these companies are are concentrate producers. Yeah. <clears throat> so they're, they they don't have an opportunity to hold on to the metal because the concentrate yeah. goes to a smelter in China or, or Japan or or Korea, yeah. and uh, and those smelters keep all that metal. They're, they they're not going to send yeah. the gold back to the United States. But, so. Let's let's spin this hypothetical a little further. If you were to hold 100 percent of your production back, well, how would the market react? So, my CFO would have a heart attack. That's yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah. But your share price, like theoretically, yeah. I would assume, would completely crumble. 
they are. Is that probably right? because yeah, because not, just it, hypothetically because, because of all of a sudden all your costs have become a loss and you yeah. have no and you have no revenue. So so you'd be booking these huge yeah. losses. Um, no, I don't think that go over, go over. No, well. like, but no. retail investors or like bullion, like you, it keeps popping up from time to time. It's like, oh, they got to control the supply, they got to hold it back to to push the prices higher. I'm not sure it's that simple. Okay. You know, the, the, the miners produce 830,000 or 830 million ounces of silver this year, approximately. So um, you'd have to hold back quite a lot, you know, to, to impact that market. And, uh, you know, the big guys are all, as I said, concentrate producers. Yeah. So the big group out of Poland, uh, a lot of the big mines uh, uh, in Mexico and uh, in Peru, Argentina, uh, these are all concentrate producers. So, you know, holding back their metal is almost impossible. Yeah. You know, if you're a dory producer, as we are, because we've got three mines that are producing Tory, we can just put it in a warehouse. Yeah. Right? And, and uh, it's much easier. I'm just curious, like, again, thinking hypothetically, if you were to hold back, like, let's assume your all-in cost is $20, just for math's sakes, mm -hmm. and you're selling at $35, so that's, and you hold back one-third of your production because you got the cost covered, mm -hmm. would that even make a dent in the market? Would that be felt? I'm just curious, like, if, if not just you, or maybe even the whole silver industry does that, would that be felt? You would have to have the whole silver industry do it together. And, and uh, you know, in my discussions with other CEOs of, of other silver companies, because, you know, I have had these types of discussions. I remember uh, it was a couple of years ago when silver was down at uh, like 14 bucks. I think it was uh, in June of uh, uh, maybe it was 2017 or 2018. I forget. Um, but I was at a meeting with a whole group of the CEOs. And I said, why don't we just say in June, we're going to hold back all our silver. Yeah. We're not going to sell any silver in the month of June. And that, you know, they all looked at me like I was crazy. <laughs> so. Yeah. That's an interesting right. concept, yeah. right? Because so. it's also a paper dominant market. So. It is, yeah. So right. if you pull the physical out of the, out of the market, then there's nothing there to back the paper. Yeah. And the banks get nervous then. Yeah. Um, maybe to sort of summarize our conversation a little bit as well, like what do you want the investors after your keynote um, to take away when they walk out of the room? What do you want them to talk about? Well, look, I've, I've, you know, I've been selling silver for a long time. You know, the silver story. Uh, you know, silver is always looked at as, or not always, but predominantly looked at as the poor man's gold. And and uh, I've, I'm always saying, no, it's not. It's not gold. Gold is money. Silver is a, is a strategic metal necessary for everything that we need to do with the human race. So we want to go green. We want to create computers and, and create nuclear plants and you know electric cars and all the things that we're trying to do, you know, to, to uh, clean up our, our electrical grid throughout the planet and even supply energy and electricity to parts of the globe that currently don't have electricity. Um, you know, we're going to need a lot more silver. And, and uh, people need to wake up to that story and uh, um, and need to have silver as part of their portfolio. Okay, now I've got a che cheeky follow-up here. Like what you just described is like you're, I'm not sure how to phrase it properly that it comes across in a way that it's not offensive to the, the, the silver bugs, meaning it sounds like you're taking the money, uh, silver being a monetary metal out of the narrative here. And I'm trying to figure out why silver is not trading alongside gold. Mm -hmm. And the, the gold-silver ratio is still high and it hasn't really kept up pace. Is it, it seems like, the, and you sort of almost indirectly confirmed that, is that the narrative is changing for silver. Is that the case? Well, people get frustrated with me when I say that <laughs> yeah. because there's a lot of people out there that believe that silver should be a currency um, and should be part of our financial system. Um, no. It's interesting enough that the Russians and the Chinese and the Indians are buying silver um, you know, for their central banks. Yeah. So, yeah, I could be wrong with my, th my thesis, but um, you know, I just think that there's so little silver around. And I have a chart uh, on my presentation this afternoon that shows that there's about 1.2 billion ounces of inventory uh, on the surface of the earth currently. And that's one year of, of consumption. Yeah. So there's only one year of cons uh, supply available. Uh, um, and that's, you know, how are you going to produce coins? How is the government going to actually introduce silver into the financial market? Yeah. I don't know how they can possibly do it. Gold, you could, it, but gold is somewhat difficult because there's such a high value. Yeah. And, and uh, you, you, you're going to walk around with an ounce of gold in your pocket to buy a loaf of bread, it yeah. makes it tough. So, it makes it expensive. <laughs> yeah, yeah, probably. Because you won't get any change, yeah. Right, exactly. So it will cause huge inflation, I'm sure. But um, uh, nevertheless, so, you know, 
silver would make some sense, but look, I, I think that industry needs silver to do all the things that we we talked about. Absolutely. And I think that's where most of the silver will be going. There'll always be a market, you know, for coins <clears throat> and bars and, and so on. And you know, that's the market that we're trying to supply. You know, and that's why we opened up our old mint uh, uh, earlier this year, and we're happily selling silver to you know retail investors around the world. Do you ship to Europe? We do, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because I've been asked yeah. a few times here, actually, okay. whether they can buy directly from you. So yeah, we have lots of clients in yeah. Germany and Switzerland and the UK. Fantastic. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much for joining us here on the floor at of the Deutsche Gold Messe, and uh, thanks very much for coming out to Frankfurt. All oh, great seeing you. Really thanks appreciate for the it. Everybody else, thank you so much for tuning into Soar Financial. I hope you enjoyed the silver market update with Keith Neumeyer. And uh, if you like the conversation, please hit that like and subscribe button, and uh, we'll be back with lots more here from Frankfurt. Thank you so much for tuning in.